Thank you. Um, so this might be totally bizarre for a lot of people, but what I want to talk to today about is about the changing nature of things in an age of biotechnology. And you may think that's strange coming from an artist and designer, but I hope it's going to become clear. So design is the transmission of ideas through things. But how will we judge if new ideas are good things when the designs themselves become invisible? Since the Industrial Revolution, design has become integral to the process of making things, the translator of new technologies into the mass of stuff that surrounds and marks progress in our everyday lives, the combustion engine into the car, the spring into the adjustable lamp, the transistor into the personal computer. Design separates what we make from what already exists, the natural living stuff that we want to control. But design is a plastic term with plastic morals. While we may enjoy the ideology that to design is to be human, design today is now mostly concerned with less grand ideals, making stuff for us to consume, shy of responsibility for the functions it gives form to and those forms' existence before and beyond their functional lives. But now, the mosquito is becoming a design object. That is, Oxytech Limited's RIDL male mosquitoes whose progeny die by genetic design. Grown in a factory, sorted by sex and released by the million, they make with wild female mosquitoes to produce offspring that are faulty and never hatch. It's a polite British design solution, I think, to a, the tricky business of eradicating pathogens on a geoengineering scale. Swiss-designed bull sperm are also being trialled, encapsulated in cellulose before, sorry about the photo, insertion into the cow's uterus, unpackaged at ovulation as her hormones trigger precision-timed conception. Fewer deaths from dengue fever and cheaper cheese may be the only experience of these products for the actual consumer. But I think this is death and life as the stuff of design. These are some of the first non-microbial experiments of, um, of synthetic biology and a, a refreshed ideology for genetic engineering as scientists and engineers around the world attempt to make biology into a material for the manufacture of systems and stuff not yet evolved by nature. These, people, these pioneers see themselves as designers, and their vision is to standardize, abstract, and de-skill bioengineering so that DNA can be made into discrete biological parts, and these can be made into devices, which can then be made into systems, so that eventually applications and functions can be the design focus of a biotech revolution. In this image is the Cambridge University um, 2010 iGen team's bioluminescent E. coli, which were brighter than any bioluminescent parts so far. More of that later. This isn't necessarily new. Bacteria have been producing insulin commercially since 1978. But bacteria are now being redesigned more effectively using synthetic biology's toolbox to try to secrete rubber for Michelin tires, expensive um, ingredients for cosmetics and pharmaceuticals, and oil for our cars. Invisible molecular blueprints are engineered at the scale of genetic circuits before being um, manufactured inside organisms of modified or perhaps one day even new design. So you may have seen this last year, Craig Venter's so-called first synthetic life form, also known as Cynthia, and the ambition is that this could be a machine for the manufacture of stuff. If successful, the way that we design, build, and manufacture materials may subtly shift from synthetic biology to synthetic, uh, from synthetic chemistry to synthetic biology. But meanwhile, the translation for us, the average consumer, could be imperceptible, because these living machines will be hidden in vats, and the only evidence of their existence will be the new infrastructure that they demand. That is, vast sugarcane plantations in faraway places like Brazil to supply food for the microbes more visible signs of bioremediating bacteria munching their way through kind of big, horrible oil spills or high-tech crops that can photosynthesize more effectively need not materialize. And I think with our predisposition to nimbyism and our squeamishness towards GM, well, especially where I come from, what could be better than this promising green-tinted technology with the scary living stuff locked away? As a result, synthetic biology has been flooded with social scientists, bioethicists, policy and risk experts examining the, the promises and peril and trying to evaluate whether this is different from what's come before. 
And their research and evaluations tending to focus on the same concerns, that of bio-error, the right technology going wrong, bio-terror, the wrong people using the right technology, and ownership, the technology itself being lost in IP thickets or subject to monopoly. And after deliberation in 2010, Obama's appointed bioethics commission basically announced that effectively this is no different in terms of promise and peril to what has come before. And we should proceed with caution. Technology is good and progress vital for civilization is basically what we can take from this. And funders are convinced Exxon has invested $600 million into fuel research and defense. DARPA this year in June announced um, uh, $30 million for its Living Foundries program. But can we really refigure biology into a design discipline aligned to progress? Progress and evolution are not necessarily the same. Progress in design and, and, in design and technology is a route towards an imagined perfection, and it moves in one direction, forward. This is technological process. They're all design classics, but the LED-powered one is the one that we think is best because it uses less power. But evolution responds to context. It's not the incremental process of perfection that we assume ourselves to be product of. This is wrong, by the way. <laughs> um, but what Symbio is proposing isn't an incremental um, iteration of nature like we've done before, like the selective um, breeding of plants. This is a wild tomato and wild corn, and these are contemporary cultivars. Or a silent manufacturing revolution powered by biotech. I think it's a change in the very nature of things we consume. And I think that autocidal mosquitoes and automated bull sperm and rubber-producing microbes are an evolution of, of, kind of like new kinds of prototypes in 21st century design. And they're a complete change from the existing design artifice. Living machines, as we impose design on them, are going to be different because they're loyal subjects of evolution, not progress. We may be able to design with biology, but these designs won't be fixed like designs we've known before. I think as synthetic biology turns science into a technology and biology into a design discipline, we really need to readdress our understanding of what design is and reevaluate it and the design in living things too. So this is the, the tree of life, and it's a human-designed object, and it masks nature's complexities. Things like life, death, reproduction, symbiosis, context, and noise. And when it comes to the intentional design of nature, these conflict with engineering's sure ideology of kind of control. So I don't think it's going to be as simple as just adding an extra branch to the tree of life. This is a project of mine where the defined and separate synthetic kingdom is a way to classify all these new and natural and unnatural products as part of our new nature. How will we judge good design? I guess some people may know here, but if it looks like this, how do you know? How do we deal with the strategies that design has evolved to, to define its role in consumerism, like obsolescence, so utility, form, uniformity? And, and how are we going to get around things that design has been able to ignore up until now? I think they're going to become vitally important, like product life cycles, disposal, context, and nature itself. While synthetic biology promises to build a better future, as we design within the realm of living things, I think we should be wary of thinking that there's one version of better. Eradicating mosquitoes may be good for us, but is it a good idea? I have no idea. But it's already being released into the environment in Brazil and the Cayman Islands and elsewhere. I think the separation that we see between our designs and ourselves is in question here. And redesigning the boundary between what we make and what we are our relationships with objects and the systems that they operate within can no longer be assumed to hold true. Even if synthetic biology is subsumed into other disciplines, I think one thing is true in a, design, in a biotech revolution, and I think that's our current language of design lacks the tools to help us imagine the unknown. So how do we develop a design discourse for speculation on the cultural function of biological objects? Well, that's what I've been trying to do. Uh, <laughs> Um, and it's a big uh, experiment. Basically, I'm trying to get as many people thinking about this as possible. So I'll show one project um, here. This was back in 2009. I went up to Cambridge University to see a plant scientist called Jim Hasloff, who's researching um, plant morphogenesis, the way plants grow. And he said to me, like, one day, maybe we'll be able to grow products inside plants. And I went back to London with my collaborator. I was saying to him, you know, we were discussing this, and it was like, one day, might our unsustainable consumption patterns be solved? 
solved by programming plants and using their logic and self-organization and modularity. And we thought that might mean like living, living organisms as industrial robots, replacing today's mechanical production lines. So we designed a commodity from this potential future to better understand it, design as investigation and not prediction. Growth Assembly, this project, is a product grown in seven parts. After the components have grown, they'd be harvested and assembled to form a herbicide sprayer. We thought this was going to be an essential commodity in this version of the future, used to protect delicate, these delicate engineered horticultural machines from the existing nature that can naturally defend itself. So the herbicide gourd is like a melon, its juice is the herbicide, and the user would put their arm through it to kind of squeeze out the poison. The thorn of the spike fruit pierces the herbicide gourd, allowing the juice to flow out. The connector fruit connects the spike to the tube, and it grows inside a shell similar to a walnut. The nozzle grows inside fruits related to the tomato. And the translucent tubes that carry the poison to the nozzle are grown like long, hollow roots. Grown, harvested, and assembled, diversity and softness are introduced into a realm previously dominated by hardness and heavy manufacturing standards. Shops evolve into factory farms as licensed products are grown where sold, and products are no longer shipped around the world because instead only seeds need, seeds need be shipped because all the manufacturing instructions are encoded into their DNA. The technology appears incredibly seductive if it would work, um, but I think it's also troubling because industry subsumes nature entirely and human design strategies replace nature's elegance. Seven design products do what nature does without intention. So how can we get these kinds of ideas into the lab and get, um, so that they're actually kind of being discussed at the bench? I'm going to show another experiment um, called e -chromi. Uh, e chromai is an experimental collaboration between designers and scientists working in synthetic biology. In 2009, seven Cambridge University undergraduates spent the summer learning the tools of synthetic biology, which is essentially a new approach to genetic engineering. Using standardised sequences of DNA in a format that's called BioBricks, they learnt to engineer bacteria. They designed their own BioBricks using genes copied from existing organisms, inserted them into E. coli, and created bacteria that secrete colours visible to the naked eye. E. Cromai went on to win the International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition at MIT in 2009. And joining us now is one of the winners of the iGEM competition. Welcome to Science Friday, Ms. Mullen. Hi, thank you so much. I am part of the Cambridge 2009 iGEM team, and our project was called E. Cromai. And what we were trying to do is to improve bacterial biosensors. They're bacteria um, that can tell you the concentration of a pollutant in water. And they can do this because inside them they have a detector. So we developed um, two different parts, the sensitivity tuner. And this actually tells the detector when to turn on and when to turn off. So you have control over um, what level of the pollutant you're detecting. And how does the bacteria show that it's on or off? We use something called a color generator, which means that our bacteria changed color when the detector got switched on. Wow, so they light up in a different color. They actually change color oh. visible to the naked eye. So let's say if you put a swab of the bacteria in the a polluted river, the bacteria would just change color. Yep, exactly. So you'd probably want to put a sample of your water on a bacterial plate, maybe not the other <laughs> way around. <laughs> well, how would you envision something like this being used other ways in the future? As designers, we worked with the team to explore eChromite's potential as they were developing it in the lab. And together, we imagined a timeline proposing ways that living colour could evolve over the next century. These scenarios, some of which are shown in this film, explore the different agendas that could shape eChromite's use and in turn our everyday lives. One of the first real applications for this technology may arrive quite soon. A cheap disposable biosensor for testing groundwater contaminated by arsenic. Bacteria could also be used to produce natural colourings and dyes. By 2015, there may be a profession of people who hunt for new pigments in the genes responsible, bringing them back for use in the food and textile industry. By 2039, you can go to the supermarket and buy the simple probiotic yoghurt for cheap personalised disease monitoring. The yoghurt drink contains E. chromi bacteria, which establish a colony in your gut. They monitor for chemical signals that indicate the presence of a wide range of diseases. 
If they detect a disease, they start generating the corresponding coloured pigment, producing an easily visible output to prompt you to seek your doctor. 2049 sees the rise of the Orange Liberation Front, a terrorist organisation from the Netherlands who are angry because a biotech company in China has patented the gene for the colour orange. In 2069, Google releases pollution mapping bacteria into the atmosphere that turn red in the presence of excess CO2. And as the saying goes, red sky in the morning, Google health warning. Our collaboration meant that eChromi was a technology that's designed from the start at both the genetic and the human scale and with a long-term outlook. We found that design and science could have a meaningful exchange in the lab, which could prove useful when developing technologies in the future. You know, you know, I think it's a new term to most of the public, synthetic. So this project was just an experiment and it started lots of kind of things to happen that we never expected. Many teams are now collaborating with artists and designers and I've taught two other teams. I've developed a workshop as a way of teaching artists, designers and scientists about synthetic biology together in a lab. And um, yeah, you can see the suitcase of poop in MoMA at the moment. And I have three on my dining room table too. But more importantly, um, many more artists and designers are now getting, uh, starting to interact with synthetic biology to explore its implications, which I think can only be good. And I'm design fellow on a project called Synthetic Aesthetics, which is an international research project initiated by the Symbio community and funded by the NSF, EPSRC. And we um, created a program of six uh, residencies between artists, designers, and scientists, um, from protocell to plant science, architecture to product design to music and smell. And we're asking these kinds of questions of them. And they're helping challenge our expectations and possibilities of the technology. Um, and sorry, um, they're introducing critical language like into the laboratory and finding different ways of doing research that are unconstrained by normal lab um, kind of research constraints. So really quickly, uh, this is Fernand Federici and architect David Benjamin. Fernand's a plant scientist, and they're looking at using nature's logic instead of nature's form, um, and using xylem cells, which are the water transport system in plants, to do complex biological spatial um, calculations, and challenging our idea of what a biological computer could be. They're now teaching a class at Columbia in architecture together. Smell artist Cecil Tolas and biologist Christina Agapakis are making cheese, challenging our conception of we are what we eat and this kind of potential conflict in, a, in our antibacterial pasteurized culture in a future powered by bacteria. And they're making human cheese to do this, um, sampling bacterial cultures from noses, philosophers' toes, and for those with good eyesight, my armpits too. But what this really hints at is something I was looking at before, which is if the gap closes between what we make and who we are, what might our experience of products be like? And in 2009, I made a series of imagined products that were based on real research, um, things like a disposable cup that was made from keratin, the protein in your hair and nails, and um, food colorants that be made from um, genes sourced in nature, which was kind of preempted e chromine. Um, a carbon monoxide sensor for your kitchen, a luminaire with bacteria in it, or microbe chips, which I was trying to think about what would a biological computer look like. What I really was thinking about, though, is what happens if symbio products that we kind of lived with were improperly disposed of or escaped from factories. And the very products we're designed to consume colonize our bodies, and our bodies become places of manufacture. This is CMYK printing ink as dental plaque would we suffer from bio, um, bioluminescent kidney stones? In this scenario, disease becomes profitable, and even beautiful, but occasionally still terminal. Um, this is a lung tumor that helpfully uh, detects carbon monoxide, but would probably kill you. Um, and I was trying to imagine, what's the ultimate synthetic pathology? And for me, that was synthetic biology as alchemy colonic alchemy. Uh, the impossible happens, your waste matter is transformed into gold. Um, <laughs> but I was trying to ask, like, in what new and unexpected ways might we see ourselves in a symbio future? Because form may follow function, but we can still decide what functions we want. But synthetic biology is, is pursuing design as, a, as like its icon. And design has rejected the burden of ideology, but found itself in crisis as a result. Art can help us explore and find ways to make tangible questions and instincts that we can't yet put into words. But I think in also opening up a space for design to examine these ideas outside its commercial remit, we may help it to rediscover its role as a transmitter of ideas through things. And I really believe that in thinking through things, we may achieve this dream of progress and evolution that we so desire. 
Thank you.